Good afternoon. Can I say a huge afternoon? Good afternoon. It's such a gorgeous day. <laughs> I know it's warm, but it's lovely to have you all here. And for those who are online, very much welcome. My name is Virginia Murray. Um, my normal day job is to be head of global disaster risk reduction at the UK Health Security Agency. So I'm very privileged to be here with you all. And data in emergencies is something that um, is remarkably important. After all, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So this is a huge shout out to Alia. Thank you so much, Alia, for bringing us together. Alia is the European Federation of Academies of Science and Humanities, and to have you visit here in London at the Royal Society with all our partners in the, uh, in the academic domain is a real privilege. And to have chosen a topic that is so cl close to our hearts is really, really key. The idea of crisis and the importance of research is something that I have reveled in listening to for the first two sessions. It's been a tremendous session this morning and just after lunch, and I hope this one, with my wonderful panelists, will be as inspiring as the others. So I wanted to introduce it because Mark Walport was talking about policy. Mark, you talked very much from a country level but I really wanted to share policy from a United Nations level. You will all know, I think, the Paris Agreement. Hands up, who knows the Paris Agreement? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Come on, a bit of active engagement. Hands up. Grand. Who knows of the Sustainable Development Goals? David, come on. You're being lazy. And finally, Who's heard of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction? Bacek, well done. Oh, some of you. So huge thanks. This is the third of the three incredible UN landmark agreements that were adopted at the UN General Assembly by all the UN member states. So every UN member state, all our governments, and by their heads of state have adopted these. They are voluntary agreements, but you can see the negotiation that's been going on around the world. Why do I raise this? Well, Mark Walport said something that I thought was really important. He said of his triangle of the three things that really mattered, if you're going to influence policy and practice from the science bit, was this really strong statement that is paragraph 24J in the Sendai framework, to strengthen the technical and scientific capacity to assess disaster risks, vulnerability and exposure to all hazards. Now I know in the last panel we talked about COVID and that obviously is something that is still deeply ingrained in our hearts, souls, families, friends, relations, workplaces, everywhere. And it's something we've really, really worried about. But to me that was so important and particularly as COVID really demonstrates the need to understand complex and cascading hazards and emergencies really important that we understand these. And one of the things that came through was the need for standards. So I'm a complete pest. I have brought the globally agreed hazard information profiles for you to see. Um, these work for the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, but are based on the Sendai framework. They are all here for anybody who feels like being a nerd. So I'm just showing it to you. But these hazards are really the all hazards we have to think about, which was something that Mark and others in the other panels were talking about, about how we try and plan for the future, having thought about what we did for the past. And we thought that was really important for you to think about and reflect on. Now, there's so much more that we could offer that has been done, but the one thing that I really wanted to take us to was really thinking about reporting. I know, Renan, you're going to be speaking on this very shortly, but I just thought it would be really important just to talk about the fact that one of the miracles, and there weren't many, one of the miracles of COVID was that we all had to report under the international health regulations for the, each Ministry of Health to the World Health Organization. 
And what they built was an incredible World Health Organization dashboard of the confirmed cases in which country, the confirmed deaths in which country, and the numbers of vaccinations across the world. Looking at it yesterday, there are over 750 million cases that have been confirmed across the world. There are over 7 million deaths, confirmed cases from COVID. But there are over 13 billion doses of vaccination that are reported to have been given across the world. To know that we have that figures, those figures from yesterday, I think helps to enrich our knowledge. And data for emergencies are really, really important in my view. So this panel will delve into the crucial role of data policy in addressing the use of data during times of crisis. We have tremendous reports from the Royal Society on the responsible and effective utilization of data in various emergencies, including health crises, looking at natural hazards and geopolit geopolitical dis disruptions. We also have the, uh, uh, the significance of data policy and facilitating data sharing, interoperability, governance, ethics, transparency, and privacy, Sheila, as well as emerging, the emerging role of privacy-enhancing technologies as one of the underlying reports that we've been looking at. But by promoting the responsible use of data, this panel aims to highlight how data policy can contribute to saving lives minimizing the impact of emergencies and supporting the recovery, most importantly, of each and every affected community. So right to that local front line. So I'm really privileged to be your chair, but I'd love to introduce from my left, Dr. Ronan Lyons. He's the professor of public health at Swansea University and has been working really closely with Public Health Wales and many other colleagues and he will share some incredible insights. Dr. Nuria Oliver is meant to be online. I don't see her at the moment. She's not even behind me or in front of me, but she's coming. Uh, she's the director of the Ellis Alicante Foundation, the Institute of Humanity Center in Alicante, Spain. Oh, hello. How lovely to see you. Welcome. You. I'm so sorry that not to, that I'm so glad you're there. Again to my left, I have Sheila Bird. Sheila is an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh and formerly the program leader of the Medical Research Council's Biostatistics Unit in Cambridge. And it's a delight to have you here because you're going to test us, I know. Whoa. But I also want to introduce my good friend Francis. Um, Francis Crawley and I work with the International Science Council's co-data team on the Committee on Data, but he is the chair of the International Data Policy Committee and I hope he's going to give us a glimpse into the future. Tough, sorry. So I think with those thoughts there and trying to set the stage for why data for emergencies are so important, I'd love to ask you, Ronan, for your incredible linking, was it 57 databases? Yes. Whoa! <laughs> Tell us all about it. So, uh, um, good afternoon. It's a, it's a great delight to be here. Uh, as I said, my name is Ronald Lyons. I am one of the things that I've done for many years is built a trusted research environment in Wales, a thing called the SAIL Data Bank, Secure Anonymised Information Linkage System, which has been in operation since 2007 and has been used for very many things. Um, before the pandemic happen happened, I was working on, uh, on an area of research funded by the Medical Research Council on multimorbidity. And we've created an entire cohort of the Welsh population through de-identified linkage, studying this from many different sources. And when the pandemic um, happened, the first thing we did was to offer our services to our Chief Medical Officer for Wales, Frank Atherton, to say we could link all the data quite rapidly and conduct policy relevant questions and help feed into um, decision making. Um, 
and one of the wonderful things about working in a small country is it's small and people tend to know each other by their first name. So I wrote, Dear Frank, and he says, Ronan, tomorrow somebody will be in contact with you. And I found myself on this Welsh Government COVID-19 Technical Advisory Group, which had experts from lots of things there. Um, and what we did then was to build this system, um, which also got additional funding from the Medical Research Council. And I need to take my hat off at this stage to the UK's research response to this, particularly to the Medical Research Council, the Economic and Social Research Council, and the National Institute of Health Research. Early on in this one, I found myself on a review panel, a rapid review panel, which actually met every week and decided what studies to fund every week, and actually funded all sorts of different studies, many of them which are quite famous, uh, lots of them trials, data linkage, but observational studies and behavioural science studies, and, and they were superb. But what we did then was we built this platform and we had increased lots of data flows. And the questions that we were asked as the pandemic evolved naturally evolved. So initially we were focusing upon who got sick and what parts of society got sick. We very rapidly showed the terrible mortality we were having in our care homes because we'd previously done all the care home linkage. And our system is a bit unique in that we also link not just at the individual level but at every household and every school, every care home and all the health facilities. And so we're able to answer lots of questions. And it's not just used for observation but we embed trials and natural experiments in there. So all of this data sort of was be feeding early decision making and I, I think made quite a difference. I think if I pick one example was the work we did with others who were also working in similar systems. There was a system uh, set up by digital um, healthcare in England. I constantly NHS forget its name because it changes its name all the time. NHS Digital. NHS digital. <laughs> and there was an RCGP surveillance system also. Um, and there was a Q Research one run by Julie Hipsley-Hawk. Also with groups in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And we collaborated tremendously over this. Um, so one of the things I think made a big difference was the early identification of who became severely ill and dead with the, the Q COVID work. And that influenced the rollout of the vaccines to people who were particularly at risk. We also showed from our linkage in schools that essentially the risk of a second infection in a household was 39 times. And compared to an infection in the same class, which was barely above one, but still statistically significant, and highlighting that household transmission was a much bigger issue than, than school transmission. But I'll, I'll, because we've got quite a lot of questions, I won't say too much more, but I'm very happy to set, talk later about the things I think that worked really well and some of the things that we need to improve upon to do things. But I would say at, at, at the end of what I'm going to say, as you can't wait for disasters and pandemics to set these systems up. These systems have to be set up in advance so they're designed and ready to do so. And I'd also um, pay tribute to colleagues in Europe. Um, we were also part of the EU, EU's population health information research infrastructure. And we are involved in comparing responses and the impact of the pandemic right across different European countries. That is something I hope we find a way of continuing to be able to, to do. But I'll stop there and uh, you can listen to Sheila. So, Ronan, I think those points you've made of the, of the incredible networks, the resources you had, and how you brought it all together is incredibly rich. And I think that's something that we should celebrate, how science really can contribute to the knowledge and the learning, but you can also do it in real time if you have the resources in place right at the beginning. So, rather than going straight to Sheila, could I go to Nuria? Noria, might you be able to provide us a summary of the work that you did during the COVID-19 pandemic in the Valencia region in Spain, using data, but you also used artificial intelligence to support policy making, and that would be really interesting to hear more about, if you'd be good enough to share a few points with us. Of course. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. And I'm sorry that I am unable to be in person, but 
I guess thanks to technology, uh, I can digitally be in this session. Um, so um, since March of 2020, I led a multidisciplinary team of scientists from the entire Valencian region of Spain. The Valencian region of Spain is located on the east of Spain, south of Catalonia, and north of Murcia and Andalusia. It has about 5 million uh, inhabitants. And having worked on the use of non-traditional data sources for the sustainable development goals for emergency response uh, uh, planning uh, and for modeling the spread of infectious diseases, in March of 2020, I felt compelled to reach out to both the central government in Spain and the regional government in Spain with the idea of creating a team from the civil society uh, working very closely with the decision makers to support their policy making and make sure that it was based on evidence and, um, and scientific sort of like um, a knowledge as opposed to intuitions or maybe, you know, political interests. Um, this um, uh, proposal was immediately very well received by the president of the Valencian government, and we can talk later as to why uh, it was such a good reception. And in, within a couple of days, we created a team of 25 roughly scientists from uh, all over the region, different universities and research centers. We were called the Data Science Against COVID-19 team, and we worked on four very big areas. The first one was the analysis of large-scale human mobility coming from the mobile network infrastructure. And this was actually a very lucky um, um, circumstance that we had in Spain. And I couldn't second and agree more with what Professor Leons has said on how you need to have uh, all these um, infrastructure and data um, systems ready before an emergency happens because there's no time you know, during the emergency. So in Spain, for over two years, the three largest telcos, which cover 95% of the population, had been working with the Spanish National Office of Statistics to um, deploy a pilot to be able to infer large-scale human mobility for national statistics. So it had nothing to do with the pandemic. That pilot started uh, in uh, November, December 2019, so right before the pandemic uh, and took place. So by February 2020, March 2020, they had all this infrastructure in place. They had all the legal um, uh, agreements done and uh, all the approvals. So they decided to extend the pilot and enable the use of this data for uh, the context of the pandemic. And Vice the Vice President of Spain appointed us in our team in the Valencian region of Spain as the pilot region to be able to um, use this data, which later on was made uh, available publicly in the summer of 2020, to have a better understanding of the impact of the confinement measures on the mobility of the population and also the spread of the virus. So we were able to analyze all that data since March of 2020. And also, among other things, we built a number of visualizations that enable policymakers and decision makers make sense of the data and answer whatever questions they needed to answer in terms of the mobility and the confinement measures. The second area that we work on was building computational epidemiological models. We built different kinds of models that took data in, in terms of the number of cases or the number of uh, deceased or the number of hospitalizations, and they would predict future number of COVID-19 cases. We uh, developed three different kinds of models, including an artificial intelligence-based model using deep uh, neural networks. That model, actually, we built it for the entire planet, for 236 regions and countries in the world. We leveraged the data sources that were mentioned before, uh, the publicly available data on the number of COVID-19 cases uh, in these 236 regions and countries in the world. And that model was part of our entry to the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge competition, which was a global competition in using AI to, to fight the pandemic. And we were the world winners of that competition. So that was incredible. And it gave us a lot of external validation, obviously. I think it was the first time that a team from Spain won an XPRIZE competition. 
The third area that we work on was built using also recurrent neural networks, so deep neural networks, to predict um, the number of hospitalizations, both in, in the general um, a hospital um, plants, but also in the intensive care units for all patients and also for COVID-19 patients. This was a special request from the government because one of the biggest concerns was running out of resources to be able to help every sick person. And the last um, big area that we worked on was a citizen survey um, to actually collect data to enable us to answer a lot of questions that we wanted to answer and the government wanted to answer, but we couldn't because we didn't have the appropriate data source. So we launched a huge citizen survey. It has over 720,000 answers. It was running uh, for over two years and it helped not only the government or citizens, but also the media and organizations to really understand what was the impact of the pandemic on people's lives um, and, um, and, and make you know, related decisions. We have many, many, we can discuss it later, we have many insights that we obtained from that survey, from you know, consistently finding that the most impacted group psychologically was the youth, to consistently finding that roughly 50% of the population age uh, 59 and younger was not able to self-isolate if they were going to be um, um, diagnosed as a positive case of COVID-19 and therefore the TTI strategy test trace isolate was going to fail because the people were not able to self-isolate in their homes and this really corroborates what Professor Leons mentioned in terms of how um, much more important was the transmission in the household than in schools. We also had the same evidence and we very strongly advocated for schools being open and we were very happy that the, that this happened in Spain and schools were opened uh, for the entire academic year 2020, 2021 and onwards and I think that was a great decision because the epidemiological impact was very low compared to the transmission that was happening in other places so I can talk also more about that later on. And the team was all composed of volunteers for over two years. Wow, that's quite a story. Mm. I you. congratulate you and what a great achievement and it's wonderful to have you online in this particular as a panel. Thank but, you. Sheila, can I turn to you now? Because I think there's an issue about privacy and how we respect the data and how you'd like to think this through with us. You gave some wonderful discussions when we were talking online in advance, so please. Take us through your thoughts. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the first point that I would make is that medical data are different. And the reason I say that is that when I give permission to my doctor to take a blood sample or do a mammogram or an MRI scan, I do not know at the time of giving that consent what the test or image will reveal about me. And that is quite different from my choosing to answer a survey when I can dissemble about my age. I've reached the age when I've started counting backwards. <laughs> so medical data are different and they are obtained under a very strong duty of confidentiality. And all of those of us who are privileged to analyse medical data must should never lose sight of that, not only in peacetime, but also during a pandemic. The second point that I want to make is something about the disunited kingdom. In Scotland, fact of death is registered within eight days of death having been ascertained. And so National Records of Scotland knows about fact of death. By contrast, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we need legislation to end the late registration of fact of death. Because if the death is referred to a coroner and subject to inquest, then fact of death is not registered until weeks, months, or years later, the coroner determines the cause of death. So that for one in five deaths, that occur at age 5 to 44 years, premature deaths, 
These deaths in England are not registered. One in five of them is not registered for six months. This is astonishing in the modern era. In any record linkage study, I need to know whether the series of hospitalizations or the series of incarcerations has ceased because the subject has recovered or been rehabilitated rather than that he or she has died. So I need to know survival status. I don't wish to delay analysis of record linkage for up to two years or more in order that I know correctly the survival status of all of my subjects. Now, that might seem to, to suggest that I'm not in favour of record linkage. On the contrary, I am a strong advocate for the discovery potential of approved record linkage studies for public benefit. They do need approval of protocols and the sort of discoveries that, that I've been involved with have been for disadvantaged individuals, uh, for example, on prisoners' health. And so it was my research team that quantified that there is a seven, eight times higher risk of drugs-related death in the first fortnight following release from prison than at comparable other times at liberty for those who have a history of injection drug use. And that was done through record linkage. But when we undertake record linkage studies, we do, in order to prevent deductive disclosure about individuals, there is a trade-off in scientific rigor. So that in that study uh, on prisoner releases uh, in Scotland, 1994 to, 1996 to 1999, uh, the Scottish Prison Service gave a list to the Registrar General of Scotland of prisoner names, prisoner number, date of release, and prison of release. And the research team of Bird and Hutchinson got prisoner number um, the, the date of release and uh, just the, the age group of, of the prisoner. We also got one variable that we hadn't asked for, but that a colleague at Scottish Prison Service, Rosine Ash, thought might be useful to us, which was an indicator variable to tell us whether the individual had been released alive into the community or was a death in prison. And for one of our deaths in prison, we did not receive a death certificate from the Registrar General. Now, clearly, the Registrar General does not make mistakes. And so, politely, we informed the Scottish Prison Service that they might like to correct their record. No mistake here, they said. What had gone wrong? Of course, the research team had not seen the list with the prisoners' names and postcodes and, and, uh, on it. And apparently there were spaces in the typing of that list. Whether Mac space Donald, I don't know, because I never saw the list. The Registrar General's program didn't cope with the spaces, and the whole thing had to be redone. But had Rosine not given us that variable, we would not have known. And that makes you feel very uncomfortable as a scientist, because your aim is to bring rigor. But it's important to avoid deductive disclosure and maintain um, confidentiality. The final point that I want to make is about data by design, as in randomized controlled trials or research cohorts, versus found data. Because often, when you are doing record linkage studies, you are making use of the data that are available rather than the data you would actually like to have. And so when we were following up for the mortality of Scotland's methadone clients, what we could analyse was the date, what we obtained, the found data, were the date of reimbursement of the prescription and the quantity of methadone that had been prescribed for that prescription. Those were the available data because that's, those were the data that were needed to reimburse the pharmacists. What you need in order to monitor the safety of prescribing is the prescription date, the daily dose, 
and the duration of the prescription. We did our best on a couple of occasions. Now, the objective is to change to data by design and get Scotland's prescription information system to be the first in the world that actually monitors the data that we need to know about the safety of opioid substitution therapy. I'll leave it there. My goodness. I, that is just a fascinating learning the work you've been doing and thank you very much for sharing that and I think the more we learn about how we understand mortality data the harder it is to be quite so certain about how good the, our dashboards are around the world and I'm sure we'll come back to that in our discussion but to go back to the COVID story and the fact that those dashboards exist at the World Health Organization, I think is really important. And I know there are many other organizations who have been pulling the data together. But the only reason why it's reported is because there is an agreement, a mandatory agreement, between ministries of health and the World Health Organization under the international health regulations, which means that you have to submit the data daily or appropriately as agreed by the World Health Organization. Now, the one thing we have got with COVID now is that although it's still a problem, it is no longer a public health emergency of international concern. But that calling it a public health emergency of international concern helped us to make sure that the data was reported. Isn't that right, Ronan and Mercia? And uh, that, that, Nuria, that's really important. So well, what, would, what should we think about in preparing for the future? So, Francis, you have been an, you're an incredible person. You're normally a philosopher who specializes in research ethics. Amazing. Integrity, methodology, oh, as well as data, AI, ethics, and law. So to be working with Francis is a real privilege because it's a different type of thinking, which I think is so important. And what I know is that you're working with many colleagues through the International Science Council and CoData and building the idea for preparing guidance on data policy for open science in crisis situations and linking to other organizations including the research um, rda the research uh, come on what's the d stand for data research data. data data sorry <laughs> I, ha I have my moment research data lines please. yes and, and also look at linking to the, the we need fair data findable accessible interoperable and reusable, so very much the sort of things that you're talking about. But I wonder if you can give us a glimpse into what the plans are possibly for the future. So um, Virginia and I have a plan. I think that's been made evident. Um, I chair the International Data Policy Committee of CoData, which is the committee of, on data from the International Science Council. Uh, just to give a bit of my journey, if that's okay, uh, Virginia. Um, uh, I started out really working with clinical trials, uh, the ethics, the regulatory aspects of clinical trials, and, and good clinical practice worked with the European Commission on establishing GCP leg legislation in the 1990s. Sat on the, w, uh, sat on the UNAIDS Ethical Review Committee for four years, so that was a crisis there. Um, uh, in the 1990s, and then worked with the WHO in establishing guidance for ethics review uh, and in establishing um, fora for the ethics review committees in uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and CIS countries. And was also then involved with the establishment of the European um, clinical trials registry and also um, sat on the committee at the WHO that set up the international clinical trial registries platform and worked with a number of European projects on establishing registries for patients and uh, researchers. So uh, that's how I got involved with data and then got involved with the um, discussions around the GDPR largely through the patient groups. And um, so data became very important. Um, in 2019, in November, just before the pandemic broke out, I was at a conference on clinical trials in Moscow. I flew directly from Moscow to another conference on clinical trials in Kiev. Well, after the, um, after the pandemic broke out, we set up a 
group with a professor from uh, Harvard University and Brigham's and Children's uh, Women's Hospital in uh, Boston, and we uh, on the COVID pandemic, where we had a, a very large global active global group that was looking at how the responses were from around the world there. When the war broke out in Ukraine, uh, a few weeks after it broke out, um, a colleague from Ukraine contact, contacted me and said, um, I'm in Poland and I need a job. So um, she's a professor of um, pharmacology and we found her a job. And uh, then we set up the Ukraine Clinical Research Support Initiative and we've been working on that too. My idea has been always that um, and this is the core of it, really. The research that you don't do during a pandemic is very difficult or impossible to do after a pandemic. That's why I'm very interested in this topic of crisis and the importance of research, because the importance of research is really to carry out the research during the pandemic as much as possible, because we cannot recover uh, what we lost here. And I think there are many lessons that we can learn from many crisis situations about the research we should have done, why didn't we do that research? We had the opportunity to do that research and we didn't do it. And that's really the failure for the preparation for the next pandemic. And uh, I very much appreciated what Mark Walport said. It's really um, the job of the scientists to do the research, to provide the evidence, and the job of the policymakers and those who are elected or otherwise in positions of authority to make the decisions with regard to public policy. Um, however, with regard to the um, project that Virginia is leading me on and the IDPC, um, we're trying to look at um, what we, we were asked um, by the CODATA Executive Committee to look at the topic of um, data policy in times of crises. So we have been doing that for almost a year now and uh, doing quite a bit of work um, just trying to understand the layout of the landscape on that and what needs to be done there. Then we had a meeting at UNESCO in Paris on the 29th of March. Virginia was there, um, Borchek was there as well. And uh, we, where we examined the UNESCO declaration on open science and UNESCO has since asked us to set up a working group in order to provide um, a toolkit for the implementation of the open science um, declaration specifically with regard to um, data policy in times of crisis. We, we, we in fact, in fact, in fact we last I believe two days ago uh, where we will uh, write a guidance um, on uh, policy, one for scientists and one for policymakers. We'll also um, write a checklist and we'll write a fact sheet. Now, if you go on the UNESCO website on, under their recommendation on open science, you can see that they have quite a few tools already listed within their toolkit. So these are just additional tools to them. But at the same time, we'll also try to implement those tools through frameworks such as the European Open Science Cloud or the Global Open Science Cloud or any of the number of other initiatives of open science or data commons that are out there and there are many out there as Canada, Australia, um, national ones within the EU and so forth. So we'd also try to link up with this because we think that What's most important is the implementation of a toolkit into practice so that during a crisis, the research takes place. And I think that's what's, for me, is most interesting here and has been very valuable to listen to here is we really have to understand as scientists what the role of research is and what our role is as scientists within this. Policy has a role within science as it does within government. The link between those things is perhaps nebulous at best, um, and it's also extremely 
let's say, tentative, if not dangerous as well, between the two. Because it's, you can threaten both government with poor science, and you can threaten science with a, or let's say, threaten government with a poor interaction with science, and science with also a poor interaction with government. So one of the roles of, uh, I think, the policy, and that's what we have to think about together, I hope, is what is the role of the scientist during a crisis situation, during an emergency situation, and what is the role of government, and how do those two interact with one another? And if we can lay out a kind of groundwork or a pathway that allows scientists to do exactly what Nuria had been doing, <laughs> um, collect that data and uh, bring that data to the policymakers and allow that data to play the role, to play the role of evidence, and not just data, but the evidence really, to play that role that it should within the societal conversation that, that evidence having its place within that conversation, but it's not the end of the conversation. Again, as Mark pointed out very clearly, I think, to have its role. So the thing that I think we need to do is to play that role as well as we can. And I think we're very fortunate with the working group that Virginia is putting together to have um, both scientists, especially um, with the International Science Council, and I hope with Alea, and also um, then with UNESCO and um, that leading on the government side there. So I think that's a good interaction or a good place to be working when we consider policy and um, the role of science um, in times of crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. It is work in progress. Uh, Nuria. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what has been said, but I wanted to share um, some valuable insight from our experience that I think was a key contributor to the success of our team, and that was the firm and active commitment from the politicians to um, make sense of all the work that we were doing to translate it into actionable insights and to um, um, accept also whatever the data was saying, yeah. which is not necessarily, um, in some cases, supporting maybe their preconceptions or their messages, you know. Um, we were fortunate enough to have the Director General for Public Policy Making reporting to the presidency. Uh, to be part of the team. Uh, she came to every single meeting and we had meetings at the very least daily. And I haven't heard of that level of commitment from any other politician in other regions of the world, but I think that was absolutely critical for our success. Um, otherwise, it doesn't matter how great your science is. If you don't have the firm commitment from the users of that science, um, it's just very hard to have the impact. And there has to, to also be this sort of exercise of translating um, and, and orienting the results based on the needs um, that I think is also something that needs to happen on a daily basis or even multiple times a day to really uh, um, and make both um, parts sort of like match. Um, so I wish there were more um, politicians that were sort of like interested or that will have the resources or the time to really um, get involved in these kinds of projects. In our experience, that was very much necessary for our work to actually be understood and also be used. I think that's an incredible comment. Can I turn to you, Ronan? Was it reflective of how it was in Wales? Yes, uh, I, mean, it, I, I found it very helpful, as I say, as a scientist there, I did not have a say on any policy. Right? But we basically did what we could to build the evidence base, so there was clarity around who was affected by how much or who was protected by how much, which then was fed back to the policy makers who could then decide on what a rational approach was to all of the difficult decisions that, that had to be made. 
I think that's really helpful. So can I just ask you another question, Ronan, if I might? Um, we know that there is, uh, and listening to the conversations we had earlier on the other panels, that access to critical data during crises, such as information on, on COVID transmission in schools and in households, which you referred to briefly, is a vital for effective response efforts. What mechanisms or protocols should be in place to ensure that timely and secure access to such data would you recommend? Yeah, so, so we've actually been doing this for years, since 2007, and we sort of set, we spent two years planning how to do it before we did it, trying to identify everything that would go wrong and to basically design it so those things were designed out of the system. Um, and, and that worked very well, but w one of the things, so we call our, th our thing a trusted research environment. I think there was a slightly different term that was used in one of the reports from, from, from the society. Um, and, and as Mark Walport said, um, trust is something that you can't just decide yourself on. It's you are trustworthy or not. And that basically represents how you behave. So what we do is very simple, is we do everything that we say we'll do. We never do anything that we say we won't do. We have public involvement in everything we do. So all of the uses of the data have to go through an independent body, which are not representing to do with the university or that. Um, members of the public are built into that. Every protocol goes to a member of the public committee. And only ones that they decide are in the interests of the public and are shown to be able to protect privacy happen. So we've done that now for very many years. We don't have a problem with it. We also encourage, and in the vast majority of studies, have members of the public actually in the study design and reporting phase. So everything we do involves members of the public, and that, that's been enormously helpful. So that's where you build trust, is get the public involved in everything you do. So that's a really fascinating comment. Thank you, Ren, and very encouraging. So, Sheila, how do we strike that balance between leveraging open access data for effective decision making while safeguarding individual privacy? Because you seem to get quite close with it with some of the prison work you did. Indeed. And, and in Scotland, a very similar development happened even earlier in, than in Wales with uh, the use of what in Scotland is called the community. Uh, health index number and everyone is assigned a community health index number at birth, it indexes their data, their health data, their social care data and increasingly educational data. That practice uh, started in about 1995 and almost 20 years on there was a very nice paper by Pavis and, and uh, Andrew Morris on unleashing the power of administrative health data, the Scottish model. But it very much has the similar features uh, to those that Ronan described in terms of uh, an approval committee uh, which determines whether the protocol that you've submitted for record linkage and the questions that you are intending to answer are indeed for public benefit. And, and so you have to demonstrate competence, you have to demonstrate ethics, you have to demonstrate uh, that you are aware and follow professional codes of conduct. In other words, that you are both trust, competent and trustworthy. And, uh, and I think it's a very important model and it contrasts quite strikingly with the care dot data fiasco in England in 2014 and with the general practice data for planning and research, a repeat effort at reading GP data in England in 2021, both of which were countered uh, by professionals on matters of competence and ethics. Vital, absolutely vital. So can I turn it round a little bit and ask Nuria if you'd like to think about the idea of establishing trust in data sources during emergencies, especially when faced with the challenge of non-trusted data. So can we improve it possibly by using privacy enhancing technologies? Are there things there that you'd recommend from your experience? Yeah, so 
um, I think um, in in it, so using sort of like non-traditional data sources um, is on the one hand extremely valuable to be able to shed light on a lot of uh, areas where you don't really have evidence about and you really need to know something about what is going on. But at the same time, um, there could be a lot of issues with the, those data sources from the reliability of uh, the data, the levels of noise, um, the veracity of the data because it could be compromised. So there are technical solutions to all these challenges. Um, ideally, there is, even if it's a small, um, trusted um, data, small data set that can be used to verify that uh, whatever you're obtaining with the alternative data source, you know, uh, makes sense. We've done that a lot, for example, when using large-scale, anonymized, aggregated um, mobile data captured by the mobile network infrastructure for a number of public good, social good projects. In many cases, we try to um, verify that the inferences and the insights that we extract from that data make sense by comparing it with some other trusted data source like a national statistic, you know, kind of data. Um, so there are um, technical solutions that can be put in place, but I, for me, and that has also been mentioned before, but I want to emphasize it, one of the biggest challenges is that if you haven't been thinking about this before the emergency, and if you don't have the, the human capabilities and some of the technical capabilities in place before the emergency, it's not going to happen during the emergency. Uh, and it will be very hard for it. If it happens, it will be really, really hard for it to happen. So I think it's very important that we invest um, on getting uh, the systems ready before. Another point that we haven't talked about, but I think was very important uh, regarding the pandemic was um, the huge amount of misinformation and disinformation that was circulating regarding all sorts of um, it, uh, aspects of the pandemic. Um, and to combat that in the Valencian region, we launched this really large scale citizen survey where we involved um, a very big portion of the population and we built visualizations of the answers uh, to the survey um, as a way to provide a trusted source of information for anyone to consult and to really um, verify if whatever random other misinformation was circulating actually you know made sense or didn't make sense so I think in addition to um, making sure that the um, data sources can be trusted and, and applying a number of techniques for these. I think another very important dimension when responding to emergencies is um, providing high quality, trustworthy information to citizens because we are, we have seen and we will continue to see a huge amount of fabricated data and misinformation circulating and citizens and the media and of course policymakers need to know where to go to actually um, access um, data and insights derived from that data that are actually trustworthy and that correspond to reality. So I think that's a very, very important element in my experience. Yes, certainly misinformation was something that really, I think, found quite a lot of anxiety making across the world and certainly WHO, I know, was very worried about it. And I think it was a real global concern. So I'd very much like to open up the discussion more widely. I don't see anything on Slido yet, but if anybody has a message that they would like to share we, and questions that they feel would be helpful to share with the panel, please let me know so that we can ask them to the relevant person. Because I think we've got a very rich and important panel who are offering wonderful ideas. Are there things that we need to do better? Are there things that we can learn from what has been done already? are the things that we might worry about from all the enormous numbers of hazards and disasters and emergencies that are occurring globally. Do I see a hand go up? Have, I, have we rather overwhelmed the audience? Ah, um, oh yes, please. Thank you. Um, great discussion. I'm from Turkey. And um, so uh, we have access to a lot of, I mean, our government has access to a lot of data. They, are, uh, they don't like to release it. 
<laughs> and so um, I was wondering um, if with these international uh, consortiums or um, collaborations uh, and with what Nuria said about alternative resources uh, uh, that can be used, implemented into the whole system to check and maybe twist the arms of governments to give up their data. Like, for example, um, the Istanbul municipality released excess data, uh, death data, so we knew from excess dates that uh, that's that um, we did not have the right data. Um, but internationally, could, who have used that for the Turkish government to give up the actual data in the case of pandemic? Because it's not just Turkey which was affected, it's the pandemic, every country is affected. So are there such policies being thought about is what I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question from Turkey. I wonder if, Bacak, we might, bother, we might ask you to make a comment. But we, one of the discussions that we had, not only from your point of view, but Bacak, I would, if you could talk a little bit about your experience in the Turkey terrible earthquake in February, which also affected Syria, where I think data became even clearer that we needed a system by which we could share the data. Bacak. Hello, thank you. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the lovely discussion. So I took uh, a lot of notes, so that was really uh, impressive. Uh, pandemic was different. That time it was very sensitive. So sensitivity of data is such thing that, that some data can be shared, some data cannot be shared, so it is important. Also trust. Trust is a key, one of the other key issues that France and Virginia, we have been always discussing in our discussions um, how, how you need to have trust to be able to share data. And for the earthquake, that, that was horrible. Uh, I'm a disaster risk manager, but statistician originally. Um, there is still data flowing from the earthquake array. Right? It has been almost five months, but we still receive data. But the, the problem is nobody knows. Like at the time of the earthquake, there was a, a massive amount of data. Uh, we didn't know it was, if it was trustable or non-trustable if it was a, an accurate data or non-accurate data, whom it came from, but there was a huge amount of data. Nobody knew how to use it because it was the time of the crisis. Everybody was shocked that was, this is a social impact. So even the experienced researchers had difficulty in understanding what the data was telling them because it was, it was really a traumatic one week, I can say, at the acute period. So there's like after five months there's still data and there will be data after a year. Next year this time there will be still data coming from the field. So when we design the policy for times of crisis, we need to consider yes before, during and after preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery, rehabilitation of the um, data and also for the policy as well. So it should go together, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So wonderful comments from Turkey, both of you. Thank you. Would, yes, Ren. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the last points you made there is, is one that bears a bit of discussion, um, and that is the skill sets out there to actually analyse and interpret and make sense of the data. They're, they're in very short supply. I mean, in our system, uh, okay, we date on millions of people and billions of rows of data, just, just vast, huge. And for people to make sense out of it, they need to have skill sets in things like programming language like SQL and that, and how to link records across multiple systems and understand what's there. And those systems, it's very easy for two and two to be 22 and not four. Um, we gave access to the cohort I created to 170 different analysts from multiple organizations, but I'd say probably two thirds of them struggled to do much with it even though they thought they had the skill sets that were needed. And so in this whole world of data and the importance of data, there is a huge skilling up operation needed right around the world in actually teaching people that how to do this and so that the answers have come quicker because one of the rate limiting steps then to providing policy relevant answers is actually the number of people who are capable of churning out really proper analyses um, to determine what's happening. I think, oh, yes, please, might you comment on that, Nuria? Well, I just wanted to really emphasize um, what um, 
has been said right now on the skills gap because it's also the slowest one to fill. Um, sort of like um, getting the right technology is a lot easier and a lot faster, but investing in the talent, in upskilling, reskilling, and new talent to join the necessary organizations, many of them are public uh, organizations, um, to um, make sense of that data is absolutely critical. I always say the data per se is digital garbage if no one knows what to do with it. And it is a, 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 um, a reality. So I've been collaborating since 2015 with an NGO called Data Pop Alliance. Uh, and one of the uh, missions for uh, Data Pop Alliance is to actually um, help uh, um, uh, close the skills gap in uh, developing countries so um, they can actually leverage the data for you know, whatever um, need, purposes and needs they have. And from Elis Alicante, the foundation that I created and that I'm, I'm working right now in, um, together with three other organizations, we've also created an international network called Nexus, which is a network um, of centers of um, excellence in using AI for sustainable development. And one of the uh, objectives of Nexus is, again, to try to bridge the skills gap that I think is one of the biggest barriers. And we try to fill that barrier by creating this data science group that was not part of the um, um, policy making organization and the government. Uh, but ideally, um, there would be um, teams of experts within the institutions that can actually benefit from the analysis of the data. Thank you. I think that's really vital comments. Uh, Francis, you wanted to add something. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you, Nuria, and, and our colleague also from Turkey. Thank you for that. I think it's very important to recognize that data comes from many places in our society. We just live in a digital society. So you mentioned the, the data that's held by governments, the data that's held by private and commercial organizations, and the data that's held in, let's say, academic or open science organizations there, and having the skill sets. I think there is a quite a bit of skill sets out there, maybe not as much as we would want, but the other thing is to link, link what already exists to preparation, response, and reconstruction during uh, emergency or crisis situations. And I think co-data has a role there in trying to encourage people to, to increase the skill sets. But I know, Sheila, you've got something you'd like to say. Yes, just coming back to the example that we were given of, of uh, in a sense, delayed ascertainment of information. And there may be very important insights in why the delays occurred as to when rescue can be um, attempted in particular areas or whether it is more or less easy to rescue children than adults and uh, even somebody who is rescued alive may subsequently die. So there are very complicated data that have a, a geographic spectrum and a longitudinal. And again, as you say, it, the, how the data are ascertained, when they are ascertained, is actually important for your analysis. So it's a very nice, a very tragic, but an important example to, to raise. Thank you. You, Thank you for coming. Yes, I, the, the question at the back of the room. There's somebody you Thank raised. you. Yes, um, yes. Simon Gotel, Foreign Secretary of the British Academy. Uh, two interrelated questions, if I may. I think they're primarily for Nuria, but they could be for the whole panel. And the first is, we talk, you talk a lot about trusted data, and of course you're talking primarily about trustworthy data for scientists, trustworthy data between regimes and between different organisations. But there's another sense, the degree to which the public trust your data, which is quite important in terms of preparedness and policy for emergencies. And you haven't talked a little bit about the difficulties of having data which may be trustworthy for a scientist, but is not trustworthy for other people who actually have to act upon it. 
And that's related to a second question, which is about the sorts of data that might be most relevant in terms of preparedness, where the data might be thought to be highly politically sensitive in the sense of, uh, for COVID, obviously, uh, questions of race and politics and uh, social divisiveness are uh, absolutely uh, causal in terms of the spread of disease, but are, and in terms of preparedness, are politically very difficult. So I wondered if you could say a little about how difficult it is to mesh different sorts of data between, as it were, the hard, if you like, numerical data on the one hand that you've been talking about primarily, but the socio-political data that's absolutely crucial to preparedness. Thank you for your comments. I think they're really important. Uh, I, I, the Sendai framework, just to raise it again, um, it has been absolutely critical on making sure that we try to pull that disaggregated data that is so important for us to have as a whole. And that's something that I think Professor Shakespeare certainly raised this morning, which I thought was very important. But I wondered if one of the panel, Sheila, do I see you jumping up and down almost? Well, I, um, I think the, the REACT study that, that was run from Imperial College in, in England uh, to measure prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 was superbly well designed, superbly analysed, rapidly reported, and yet there was only a 15% of those randomly selected to take part in that surveillance did so. So I think we have a job to do in this country uh, to increase the response rates for really well-designed uh, public health surveillance studies. Uh, and I don't know whether it is the extent of disinformation that is around, whether it is the, you know, that we're all bombarded with online surveys that have no value at all, and so it is difficult for the public to know which are, if you like, kite-marked uh, surveillance studies and which not. But I think it is something that, ahead of the next pandemic, we really need to sort out when excellent work like that. And if the public realised how good it was, I cannot imagine that the response rate would, would have been at the levels that, that they were. Thank you. I think it's very good. Ren. Yeah, no, I, I think there's quite a lot you can do with design studies embedded in the routine data ones. So you can, we've done this with lots of cohorts and, and surveys, including the ONS COVID infection survey, where you can embed one and the other, and that gives you insight into who, who participated and who didn't, and, and, and measurement of some of the biases. Uh, we were fortunate in our, in our one to get permission from the ONS to link in the census, the 2011 census, and that was really important for us to be able to report um, to a group, the, our first minister's black, Asian, minority ethnic group, on what the sort of ethnic differences were in infection and outcome, and also subsequently in vaccine uptake. And there are quite a lot of data sets that have social and environmental things in that are really important in this context. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that there is a group who are continuing this work in Wales as part of a thing called Administrative Data Research UK, and there's a four-nation component of it. And there's a group working on social justice and all the protected characteristics and to basically monitor whether people are being treated fairly and to look at policies and all sorts of interventions. So I, I think there is an awful lot that can be done, and we just perhaps need a little bit more of it. Thank you. Did I see your hand up, Nuria? Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to comment on the maybe lack of involvement and participation from the civil society in, 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 uh, to contribute to science. And I think um, there are several factors that uh, probably play a role. I think the first one is the fact that um, I don't think we do enough communication of science, broadly speaking. Um, and so still, it seems like a very distant kind of far away um, concept for a lot of people. Um, and I think I, I, in, in our experience, because we did deploy this really large scale survey and it was extremely touching and emotional to us to see the massive response 
In the first 40 hours, we collected 140,000 answers. Um, people from all over the place, associations, NGOs, universities, town halls, mayors, everyone wanted to contribute and share it and, and so forth. So it is possible to um, create engagement and the energy for people to contribute, but it is it's definitely not a given. For us, something that um, helped a lot was that we built this uh, visualization tool immediately so everyone could see um, the results of their contributions. Um, so they got a sense that, okay, I am, I am helping to something larger than myself, but I can see you know, and I can benefit somehow by seeing you know, the results in, in, immediately. Um, and I think that was very, very helpful. Um, I think it also helps if there is a trusted kind of neutral entity doing this. In some cases, uh, there isn't a lot of trust in governments. So if it's an initiative that is coming from the government, um, unfortunately, because in some countries or some regions of the world, there isn't really that much trust in the government, you know, it, it, it's probably more beneficial if it's coming from a neutral, m more trusted entity, which usually could be a scientific, you know, entity of some kind. Um, but I think one um, um, piece of work that can be done now is really um, reinforcing the connection between society and science and bridging that gap and having more maybe scientists you know learn how to communicate uh, in non-technical terms and and somehow fostering a culture where people would also be more interested and knowledgeable about you know science scientific and technology topics as I think we are generally today uh, because otherwise when an emergency happens, if we don't have some of the foundations built, it will be very hap very difficult and we'll be in the same situation as we were in the last emergency. I think, Noria, you've really raised a very important issue, as have you, Ronan and Sheila, and of course, Francis. Uh, we are, we've moved into a new world where data is so much more accessible, not perfectly, as you pointed out so clearly, Sheila. Um, different issues in different countries, but Ronan being able to pull together all those databases the whole way through, to share the data, to prove where the risks are, and to hear how you've managed to do it or with all your skills locally, but also to take forward the need of having this idea of working closely with UNESCO and their open science program, linking to fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, particularly because David Alexander has sent this message on Slido. For decades, applied research on mortality and morbidity in earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, and volcanic eruptions has languished. And I think that's what we saw in Turkey and Syria, wasn't it, Pachak? This is mainly because of the lack of access to data. So it's not just having data that's trusted or not trusted, but it's having access to data. And understanding these patterns of death and injury in such events is vital so that we can manage these desperate emergencies. But you pointed out it's actually needed by people right at the front line to help with rescue work. So to me, this incredible panel of wonderful people who've contributed such amazing things on data for emergencies, I think we have some great ideas from this. I think we have a way forward, Francis, with your leadership, which has been just incredible. And I would like to suggest that anybody who's interested in trying to join that work that Francis is leading, please let us know, because we would love to reach out to you all to engage, to try and do something that might make it slightly less painful in the next Disease X. Thank you to my panelists.